Today, I'm learning about Napoleon's battle with Prussia. I think I would have had a nervous breakdown, honestly. This is terrifying. I'm just thinking about these poor people in these villages at 6.30 a.m. waking up to this. Now, if you're coming from my video that I just did on Prussia, welcome. If you're not coming from that, then, you know, welcome too. Roger and I are excited to get back into the Napoleonic Wars. We're going through the entire series. There are like 20 something videos in this, so we've got a ways to go yet, but I'm enjoying it so far. How are you liking it, Roger? He hasn't taken his hat off for like two weeks, so that's how much he's enjoying it. So the last video we did was on the Battle of Trafalgar, and it was not on this channel because apparently Epic History TV doesn't really go into the naval battles very much, but I really, really did want to kind of experience that part of it because I'm assuming that the naval campaigns were just as important, if not maybe more important, than land campaigns were. I really appreciate all of you guys who commented on that video and taught me a lot about some of the naval warfare tactics. I actually even took notes on your comments, as you can see right here. This is just to help me kind of keep track of what I'm learning about because otherwise I'm having to keep it all like up here and you know how that kind of goes. I'm actually using a notebook that I use for a bunch of other stuff. So what I think I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go and buy an actual notebook for just these videos that I'm doing and kind of keep track of what I learned from you guys in these notebooks and also from the videos as well. I don't want to take notes while I'm watching the videos because that would be too distracting, but I'd like to at least keep track of the main things in each video and of the main things that you guys bring up in the comments, especially if you answer any of my questions. I really am serious about learning this stuff, guys, so I really do appreciate you guys contributing to that. Because of you, I am going to be watching a video on the Holy Roman Empire to learn more about that. I do want to actually watch a video of the HMS Victory that you guys said was actually docked and is a museum ship now and it's the oldest commissioned warship which is pretty cool I didn't know that a couple of you guys sent me video links that I can watch on that so I'm planning to do that you guys mentioned that I should watch master and commander Waterloo and hornblower I would love to watch all of those with you guys actually I don't know if I can do them on YouTube I don't know how well that would go over on YouTube but I am kicking around the idea of doing like just a really cheap patreon channel where I can watch these longer things with you guys most people on YouTube are not going to sit through like a two hour movie or like a really long 10 or 20 hour mini series about World War II. That's going to be more for just like the diehard history fans. So I don't know. You guys can let me know what you think about that. I also learned from you guys the ships had to depend on wind speed and direction and stuff, which makes sense because they didn't have motors back then. And that they used flag signals to tell each other, you know, what to do or if they were going to surrender or whatever. There were sharpshooters up in the baskets on the mast, you know, shooting down at Admiral Nelson and anybody else who had like a fancy uniform and medals on, on deck. Some of you guys kind of let me know what the difference was between brigs and frigates and schooners and cutters and ships of the line so I really appreciate that and also for letting me know what the broadside is now I know what the broadside is but we're gonna get back onto land here with Prussia and Napoleon in the Napoleonic Wars. I kind of have a very 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 cursory overview <laughs> of what Prussia is and what Prussia was. So hopefully that will be enough for me to kind of appreciate this video. Anyway, let's go ahead and watch it. An Epic History TV History March collaboration supported by our sponsor, The Great Courses Plus. In December 1805, at the Battle of Austerlitz, Napoleon Bonaparte, Emperor of the French, won a crushing victory against the joint forces of Austria and Russia. Napoleon now dominated Europe, able to hand out spoils as he saw fit. In February 1806, he sent an army led by Marshal Massena to overthrow the King of Naples, who had dared to side with his enemies, and gave his throne to his own brother Joseph instead. Another brother, Louis, was made King of Holland. His German allies, like Bavaria nepotism. and Württemberg, were elevated to the status of kingdoms. While Napoleon made himself protector of the Confederation of the Rhine, a new alliance of German states that would contribute 60,000 troops to his army. In recognition of the new reality, Emperor Francis of Austria 
formally dissolved the Holy Roman Empire. Founded by Charlemagne a thousand years before, but now without influence or purpose. Austria had been humiliated. France remained at war with Britain, Sweden and Russia. But in the summer of 1806, all eyes were on Prussia. Napoleon is a monster who was emerged from the mire. Queen Louise of Prussia. Okay, she didn't like Napoleon. The Prussian king, Frederick William III, regarded Napoleon with deep mistrust and had been about to join the coalition against him when news arrived of its disastrous defeat at Austerlitz. He was heavily influenced by his wife, the celebrated and popular Queen Louise, who detested France and Napoleon. She led the influential War Party at the Prussian court. Matters came to a head over Hanover, a German state which had belonged to British King George III, been occupied by the French, and given by Napoleon to Prussia as compensation for other territorial changes. Now the Prussians learned that Napoleon had secretly offered to give Hanover back to Britain in exchange for peace. I love how all of these like leaders, kings, generals, whatever, are just like given territory back and forth with no regard to the people that actually live there. <laughs> I don't know, maybe it's not giving me the full story, the full picture here, but I can imagine that if I was a person, just an average person, living in like Hanover, for instance, and I kept changing hands, you know, between these different kingdoms and these different powers, you had no idea what the heck was going on or what life was going to be like, I'm sure, under these different powers. I think I would have had a nervous breakdown, honestly. Critly offered to give Hanover back to Britain in exchange for peace. Frederick's advisers now persuaded him that war was the only honourable course. But Prussia then made a basic strategic blunder, sending an ultimatum to Napoleon without consulting its new allies in the Fourth Coalition. Their forces were too far away to help Prussia, who would now face Napoleon's Grande Armée with just the small state of Saxony for support. That's another thing. I brought it up in, I think, one of my previous Napoleon videos. I, I just, I'm so used to thinking about things in terms of like World War II, where you have vehicles and you can get armies from one place to another in a fairly rapid pace. Like if this was in World War II, you know, I don't think Russia would have had any problem coming and helping Prussia at that point. But you have to think back to these days where you have just basically horses as your transportation or you're walking on foot and it would take weeks or maybe even months to get there and so yeah you have to be way more careful about your strategy in this type of situation I feel like. So that's actually a really good point that I forget about when I uh, watch this stuff. Behind the fine facade all was mildewed. In 1806, the Prussian army had a fearsome reputation that dated back 50 years to the reign of Frederick the Great. Napoleon, a student of history, regarded it with respect. But Prussia's army had been allowed to rest on its laurels. Its generals were old. Its staff work hindered by bureaucracy and personal rivalries. Its movements ponderous and predictable. Prussian soldiers, however, could be relied on to fight with pride and determination, while Prussian cavalry was regarded as amongst the best in Europe. In October 1806, Napoleon invaded Saxony with an army of 166,000 men and 256 guns. Advancing in three columns, the French crossed the mountain forests of the Thuringerwald, along roads carefully reconnoitred by scouts and spies. Napoleon intended to threaten Leipzig and force a decisive battle with the Prussian army, which he believed was near Gera. The Prussians were, in fact, further west, concentrating near Erfurt, on the west bank of the River Saale. 
its commander, the Duke of Brunswick, had hoped to threaten the flank of Napoleon's advance. But wrong-footed by the speed of the French, he now ordered a retreat north to find a new defensive line. On the 10th of October, at Saalfeld, Marshal Land's Five Corps clashed with a Prussian advance guard, commanded by Prince Louis Frederick, the King's cousin. The Prussian force was routed, and Prince Louis himself killed in combat with a quartermaster of the French 10th Hussars. Oh my gosh. I mean, I'm just looking at this, and I mean, if I was a soldier back in those times, and this was what the battlefield looked like, I would probably scream running the other way. It's scary enough now where, you know, you basically have a big open field and you're firing guns back and forth, maybe miles even away from each other. I don't know. I, I, I don't really know what distances are realistic these days, but this is terrifying. This is absolutely terrifying. But he just said that a prince was killed, I think. I'm gonna go back and listen to that again. The Prussian force was routed, and Prince Louis himself killed in combat with a quartermaster of the French 10th Hussars. Three days later, Lan made contact with a large Prussian force near Jena, and sent news to Napoleon. The French Emperor, believing he'd found the main Prussian army, rapidly issued orders for his corps to concentrate for battle at Jena. Bernadotte's one corps and Davout's three corps were to cross the Sala and fall on the Prussian flank from the north. But Napoleon was wrong. Lan faced a 35,000-strong Prussian rearguard, commanded by General Hohenlohe. The main Oof. Prussian army, 52,000 men under the Duke of Brunswick, was further north, mm. moving straight into the path of Davout's three corps. In warfare, there is but one favorable moment. The great art is to seize it. Yeah, probably true. The Battle of Jena began at 6.30 a.m. on the 14th of October, in thick fog. Marshal Land's Five Corps already had a toehold on the plateau west of the town and river. His first task was to drive back the Prussians, and win room for the rest of the French army, arriving by the hour, to deploy. His infantry led the way, and fierce fighting broke out for the villages of Kospeda, Klosowitz, and Lutzeroda. Meanwhile, Augereau's seven... Just, I'm just thinking about these poor people in these villages at 6.30 a.m. waking up to this. Lutzeroda. Meanwhile, Augereau's seven corps advanced through a ravine, emerging onto the plateau on land's left flank while Sultz, four corps, climbed steep tracks to form on his right. Napoleon joined Lan in the centre of the battlefield, organising a 25-gun battery to support the attack on Wurzenheiligen. The village was won, but then lost to a determined Prussian counterattack. On the right, around 10 a.m., Sult's infantry secured Klosowitz, but was counterattacked on its right flank near Rudigen. A decisive charge by Sult's light cavalry drove off the Prussians, routing their infantry and capturing two enemy colours. As six corps began to arrive on the plateau. Its fearless but impetuous commander, Marshal Ney, ignored orders and dived into the fighting around Wurzenheiligen, becoming briefly cut off by a Prussian counterattack and having to be rescued by guard cavalry. General Hohenlohe was expecting the arrival of 15,000 more troops under General Ruschel at any moment. Until then, he remained chaos. largely inactive shoring up his line, 
and ordering limited counterattacks. But he had run out of time. Napoleon had begun the day with just 25,000 men. By 12.30, a steady stream of reinforcements had brought oh his strength gosh. up to 96,000. As the Emperor rode past the Imperial Guard, one young soldier, eager to be sent into action, called out, Forward! Napoleon stopped and demanded to know who had spoken, then rebuked the soldier as a beardless youth, who ought not to offer advice until he too had commanded in 30 battles. But the moment had arrived. Although the Guard, to its frustration, remained in reserve, the other French corps were ordered forward in a general attack. The Prussian army began to give ground. At first it kept its discipline, but then disintegrated into a general rout. Murat's cavalry were launched in pursuit, riding down and sabering hundreds of fleeing Prussians. General Ruchel's two divisions finally arrived, at the worst possible moment. They briefly held up five corps' advance, but were soon outflanked, broken up by cannon fire, and charged down by French cuirassiers. The marshal must be seeing double. Meanwhile, 12 miles to the north, near Auerstadt, Marshal Davout was marching southwest expecting to fall on the Prussian left wing at Jena. Instead, he encountered the Duke of Brunswick's main Prussian army, heading north to take up new positions. Davout's three corps, 27,000 men and 48 guns, was about to face odds of two to one. While Bernadotte's one corps, which had orders to support Davout, was nowhere to be seen. Davout, nicknamed the Iron Marshal, showed no signs of alarm. He formed his first division into a defensive line centered on the village of Hassenhausen. I mean, what the his infantry to forming squares to repel a series of cavalry charges by General Blücher's advance guard. Oh my gosh, he is way out His other two infantry divisions arrived to strengthen the line, standing firm in the face of repeated Prussian attacks. But Prussian movements were slow and poorly coordinated, nor did they use their numerical advantage to try and outflank Davout. At a crucial moment, the Duke of Brunswick was shot through the eyes, a wound oh. that proved fatal. Oh, that's not... King Frederick well, William yeah. himself took command. Several Prussian units remained uncommitted, but the king, convinced he faced the main French army under Napoleon, dithered. Around 1215, Marshal Davout counterattacked. The Prussian army turned and fled. That's amazing. Davout had won a stunning victory against the odds, but at a heavy price. His corps suffered 25% casualties. One man. I feel like the Prussians really helped him out, though, just by their incompetency. I don't know, like, he's just really kind of rushing through these battles, and he's not really going through all of the details, so maybe there's stuff in here that the um, French are doing that gave them this victory. But I feel like just based on what I just saw, it looks like the Prussians basically just gave it to them. They didn't take advantage of their superior numbers, and they basically defeated themselves, it looks like, at this point. But I don't know, you guys could Correct me if I'm wrong with that. Price. His corps suffered 25% casualties. One man mm. in four killed or wounded. While inflicting twice as many losses on the Prussians. Wow. Tell the marshal that he, his generals, and his troops have gained everlasting claims on my gratitude. So I guess he's talking about, what was his name? De Devant or something like that. I like all of these little quotes that he puts in these. When news reached Napoleon that Marshal Davout had engaged and defeated Davout. the main Prussian army, he reacted first with disbelief, 
then heaped praise upon the Iron Marshal, later awarding him the title Duke of Auerstadt. Marshal Bernadotte, in contrast, was nearly court-martialed for failing to support Davout. Huh? Napoleon's army began a masterful pursuit of the beaten Prussians, giving them no time to regather their strength. Two weeks after the twin battles of jena auerstadt Napoleon's troops, led by Davout's heroic Three Corps, entered Berlin. The next day, oh, General Hohenlohe back. surrendered at Prenzlau. Really? At Lübeck, General Blücher and 20,000 Prussians were driven out of the city in heavy fighting and forced to surrender while 25,000 Prussians besieged at Magdeburg surrendered to Marshal Ney. Prussia's army had been devastated by a Napoleonic blitzkrieg. In just 33 days, Prussia had lost 20,000 dead, 140,000 prisoners, 800 guns, and this 250 standards. That's crazy. It was a humiliation that proud Prussians like General Blücher would neither forget nor forgive. Unlike Saxony, King Frederick William refused to make peace with Napoleon. He continued to hold out in East Prussia, trusting in the approaching Russian armies to rescue his kingdom. Despite another glorious victory for Napoleon and the Grande Armée, the war was not won yet. Well, well that was a little bit more dramatic than I thought it was going to be. One of my thoughts that I had towards the end of that was, you know, World War II is one of my favorite eras in history so far. And you study about the different countries going to war with each other, you know, Germany versus France and Great Britain and so forth. And I didn't really realize the history of war between all of these countries. In my naive mind, I kind of had this picture that World War II was one of the first like major conflicts between these countries and that's not the case at all you know this stuff goes back centuries maybe even millennia because I haven't really gotten into the older history very much yet but yeah I'm starting to see how Napoleon is shaping up to be a very very masterful military commander and leader in history and a lot of you guys have said that kind of modern Europe as we know it today kind of came out of Napoleon or he influenced it a lot in a lot of ways so I'm looking for Forward to seeing how this progresses throughout the rest of the wars and then how all of this kind of influenced the world as we know it today. That's one of the most fascinating things about history for me is just kind of putting all of the pieces together to see how we got to where we are. That was a great video. Roger, did you like it? I don't know what he's saying. <laughs> I'm assuming it's yes. And if you guys like this video, then hit that like button and subscribe. We've got a lot more content like this coming your way and some different stuff. I like to mix it up a little bit. Also, please do answer any of my questions or if you just want to kind of expand on anything that this video touched on or anything I brought up in the video, then please do that below. You guys know I read your comments and I learn from them. So stay tuned for the rest of this series and we will see you next time. Thank you.